Well, I'd like to welcome everybody. Jay Baba. This is the Mayor Spiritual Center virtual presentation that we will be doing uh, every third Sunday of the month. My name is Susan McDonald, and I'm the historian and librarian of Mayor Center. It's a pleasure to invite everyone in tonight for the first of many talks that uh, Dr. James Newell, Jamie Newell, uh, will be giving on the historical perspective of Mayor Baba. Uh, I'd like to, first of all, just uh, kind of set some ground rules, if you will. Uh, please keep your mics muted during the course of the talk. And uh, at the end of the presentation, there will be a uh, Q&A, and uh, I'll give some more details about how we can ask those questions and have those questions answered. Uh, we can use the chat box uh, for you to uh, phrase a question that we'll select. Uh, also, you can also do the raise hand function that's within Zoom for questions, but we are going to hold off on all questions until after the presentation is completed. So um, again, thank you so much for joining this evening. Uh, we have uh, almost uh, 50 people uh, tonight. And so I'd like to begin with uh, introducing Jamie Newell. So Jamie, take it away. Thank you, Susan. Thanks everybody for coming. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and get started because uh, I like to talk and I'm gonna do a lot of that So. Uh, this will facilitate some of that. So, uh, as Susan said, um, let me see, can you see that now? Whoops, I messed it up again. Hold on. That just happened. Mm -hmm. I'll get it. Okay, you can see that now, right? Yes, okay, good. All right. So, uh, Susan said, this is Mayor Baba of Ambedkar, his life in historical perspective. And uh, the whole approach is going to be Mayor Baba and the context of history. So, I want to welcome everybody. This is, as uh, Susan said, our first installment of the series. And I want to thank the Mayor Center and especially Buzz and also uh, Susan McDonald and uh, Joe Stewart, who are helping us up, but especially uh, Buzz Connor for inviting me to present and uh, to be able to do this. It's really uh, just, uh, for me, just a wonderful privilege uh, and a joy to be able to present my thoughts about Mayor Baba's life. Uh, right direct here, we're being webcast live from the uh, Mayor Spiritual Center. So uh, the idea of the series is to be biographical, and of course, biography, by definition, is about story. A biography is essentially a story of someone's life, and most of the stories about Mayor Baba, whether they're in print or whether you hear people talk about Baba, are presented by people usually. Uh, most of us have heard these things through people uh, who follow Mayor Baba, who have met Mayor Baba. And uh, the idea usually is to try to inspire uh, love and uh, devotion uh, and appreciation for Mayor Baba. Uh, this is the point of most of the publications and most of the uh, talks that we see. Uh, and this idea, this approach is, of course, ideal for people who are following Mayor Baba uh, to present his life story in that way. But to to present to people who've never heard of Mayor Baba and also people who want to kind of examine historical figures from an academic perspective, um, uh, what I want to do, uh, the purpose of this series now, is to present his life in historical perspective in a way that can be understood and appreciated by just about anyone, whether they follow Mayor Baba or they don't follow Mayor Baba. So in the spirit of uh, the idea that biography is story, I want to just begin with a story, and then I'll sort of pick up. What I'm going to do is present, as I said, there's going to be really three lenses through which we're going to look at Mayor Baba's life throughout the uh, whole series. Uh, the first lens, as I've just described, is the if through what my training is, is through the history of religions. And then uh, under that sort of umbrella, we're going to look at uh, 
the pivotal experience of his life, which I'm going to tell a little story about first. And also we're going to look at him through his Persian ethnicity. And I'm going to describe a lot of that uh, as we go along. And it's going to sort of form the basis and the lens through which we perceive the, the whole series and the whole collection of stories about Mayor Baba. So to begin with, one day in May in 1913, a 19-year-old college student named Mayor Wan was riding his bicycle through the British military camp area of Pune, India, which is where he lived. As he pedaled his bicycle on his way to school, he saw an elderly, white-haired woman sitting under a neem tree. He had seen her sitting there before, but this time she caught his eye and she beckoned him to her. Merwan felt himself strangely drawn to this old woman, and he went right before her, and as he went to her, she stood and she embraced him. Well, up to this point in his life, Merwan had been a successful and a popular student. He was well-loved by his friends and his family. Merwan's mother, Shireen, had high hopes for her favorite son. She had dreams that he would one day become a successful businessman, that he might attain to some high stature and influence in this small Persian community of which they were a part. However, all of those dreams, all of that changed when Merwan met this elderly woman who sat under the neem tree. The old woman was known locally as Hazrat Babajan. She was a Muslim holy woman who was much respected as a saintly person by the Muslims living in the camp area there in Pune. Merwan himself was a Zoroastrian by birth and a Persian by ethnicity, but the difference in faith between him and Babajan was completely irrelevant to Merwan. After he met Babajan, he appeared outwardly normal, but his behavior began to change. Little by little, although he had been an, a successful and an attentive college student, he began to lose all interest in his studies. He increasingly spent his evenings sitting with Babajan, and the respectable people in this local community of Pune, the camp area, shunned Baba John. They considered her to be a madwoman. Uh, these attitudes, of course, had no effect on Merwan. He was just sort of transfixed with her. He continued to be drawn to her, even though they barely ever spoke to each other throughout all this period. Then uh, one night in January in 1914, after sitting for some time with this old woman, Merwan kissed her hand before leaving to go home. And at that time, Baba John took Merwan's face in her hands and kissed him on the forehead between the eyebrows. Well, many years after this event, after Merwan had become known as Meher Baba, he spoke of this experience of receiving the kiss from Baba John. And he said, quote, at the time, Baba John gave me the nervicult or inconceptual experience of my own reality. The illusory, physical, subtle, and mental bodies, mind, worlds, and one and all created things ceased to exist for me, even as illusion. Close quote. Now, it's reported that after this experience of being kissed by Baba John, Merwan appeared to be in a type of comatose state. It's reported that he barely ate or slept for some nine months. The local people, doctors, and even his own mother were completely convinced that he had gone utterly insane. Yet after several years of wandering, of seeking out the contact of a series of spiritual teachers, and after an extended period under the tutelage of the Hindu spiritual teacher Upasthi Maharaj, Mirwan appeared to have returned completely to normal. And although uh, he was returned to normal, and he was now certainly not insane, he was not only not insane, but he had become extremely high-functioning. However, his academic life and any aspirations for a business career were now completely over. Instead, he gathered around himself a number of disciples, and he began functioning as a spiritual master himself. So I begin with this story of Merwan's encounter with Hazrat Baba John, because it's really the central, pivotal event in the life of Mayor Baba. Literally everything that follows in his life flows not only from the importance of this event to Merwan personally, but also from the cultural context in which this event occurred. Merwan's relationship to his parents, his relationship to the Persian community of Pune, 
and to the surrounding cultural landscape of British India in the early 20th century. Uh, all of this shaped his life experience before and after his encounter with Baba John. Now, uh, as I've already noted, uh, in this series, it's my hope to tell the story of Mayor Baba's life in a way that's descriptive, that's historically accurate, and uh, and I actually, and I'm not even claiming, I'm expecting and hoping, I have many, many friends out there who'll be listening in, and I know that I will do say things that aren't completely accurate. I'm trying to do broad strokes, and so I look forward to uh, the constructive uh, corrections that I receive from people, but I'm going to try to be accurate, and uh I want to tell the story uh, in a way that can be appreciated by almost anyone, whether they are absolutely new to the name of Mayor Baba and to his life, or whether they are longtime followers. So my own training is in the academic field of the history of religions. One of the tenets of this discipline is to present religious phenomena, and right there, even using the word religion, uh, I know a lot of people bristle at that. Mayor Bob is not a religion, and it's uh, it's about spirituality. And even academic scholars don't like the word religion, but you'll hear me use that uh, talk about religious experience, religious phenomena. Although we don't like that, and, and scholars don't like that, but uh, the try is we might, no one's really come up with a better word. And when we talk about descriptions and uh, definitions of religion, the the phenomena mayor baba and the phenomena around him kind of tick all the boxes that would fall into that category so uh, i'm going to try to steer away from it but from time to time we'll use terms like history of religions and uh religious phenomena like that so one of the tenets of the discipline is to try to present religious phenomena in a descriptive way without relying on faith statements or confessions of faith or uh simply repeating a religious narrative in a way that's uh, supposed to be accepted by the listener. It, it should be uh, presented in a way that anyone can examine and uh, uh, try to evaluate such statements on their own and do their own research. And uh, and that's sort of the, the purpose of the discipline, and it's what I'm going to try to do as well. So the goal is to present historical data in a way that can be understood and accepted by most people, by most observers or most listeners or however you want to put it. So in terms of Merwan's encounter with Baba John, there are multiple attestations. That means multiple reports about these events in the historical record. Now, even so, in the same way, there are also multiple ways that people have understood these events. Uh, in other words, it's not just uh, people don't just accept the fact that Mayor Baba said he had a spiritual experience. Uh, the Persian community in Pune considered it a foregone conclusion that poor Shireen's favorite son had lost his mind. Merwan was known at that time as the mad Irani, the lost child. For several years, he was just wandering around. He continued to run after, by their perspective, to run after so-called saints. And he was someone who had even managed to dupe some of the local people, the more gullible local people, into considering him to be a spiritual figure himself. Of course, those who did become followers of young Merwan interpreted his experience very differently. And, of course, uh, Marijuana himself also interpreted it differently. But as the decades rolled up by, uh, Mayor Baba, uh, as Mayor Baba, Marijuana not only attracted a large international following, but he managed to produce a number of very well-articulated spiritual texts on spiritual practice and cosmology that were philosophically astute and which synthesized a number of mystical ideas from different spiritual traditions. And it's kind of hard to maintain this idea that he's the mad Irani when he's uh, functioning in a very high way and producing very uh, respectable uh, and and really sophisticated spiritual texts. And this is something that we're going to continue to uh, look at as we go through the, the whole series. So the question arises when we look at these things, which version of Merwan's experience are modern people supposed to understand? Did Merwan simply recover from a psychotic break or a nervous breakdown? Or did he experience the unica mystica, the mystical union described by mystics of the past? Throughout his life, Meher Baba himself described himself as first a sad guru or a perfect master, which is a fully God-realized person. And then later, he described himself as the avatar, an incarnation of God. 
So how are we, as rational modern people, to understand his mental and or spiritual state throughout his lifetime? How are we going to evaluate these things? Uh, I know there's a story where uh, Mayor, during the three incredible weeks, Mayor Baba asked the men there, uh, what do you take me to be? And uh, one of the men said, they said various things. And one of the men said, I take you to be a perfect master. And Mayor Baba looked a little puzzled and he said, how would you know? How could you tell that I was a perfect master? And And that's the same thing. How would we evaluate? How are we going to evaluate this question honestly and in a way that's acceptable both to us and to, to anyone else who, uh, who is, is evaluating the same data? So followers of Mayor Baba may uh, adhere strictly to the religious narrative of his life and experiences that he's a, a master, that he's God in human form, that he uh, is doing spiritual work and all that. But how are under, others to understand him when they just come in cold and, and encounter this, by all accounts, remarkable man. Uh, well, this is uh, what we're going to be considering throughout this, uh, this series. So anthropologists and religious studies scholars have used a variety of criteria to differentiate between spiritual and neurotic or even psychotic experiences. One of uh, the common criteria is to look at both the general stability of the personality but are they, you know, are they able to function in the world? What's their stability? Uh, and to look at that, and as well to look at the cultural context and the local cultural understandings of mystical or religious experience. Uh, for a long time, the early anthropologists all labeled shamans as being psychotics and neurotics and just crazy. And then, particularly in in modern times. Uh, when yeah, there's a, been a huge uh, sort of renaissance in the study of shamans and the shamanic experience. And they see now that the functioning in the context of a group, uh, the shamans often are actually the most highly functioning. And although I'm not saying that Mayor Bob is a shaman, uh, or now we'll get into the anthropological categories, but he falls into a category of someone who receives revelation. There's a priestly caste who preserves revelations, and there's the uh, the shamanic type who receives a revelation, and uh, Mayor Bob would fall into that category. So we, again, uh, to look at him in that way, we want to see, well, what exactly uh, is the context, how is, how is this understood, and from where does he get his own interpretation of his experience? So the cultural context of Merwan's immediate family and community life was decidedly Persian and Zoroastrian. Uh, although he was also exposed to Hindu, Muslim, and British colonial influences as well, it can truly be said that from the day he was born in David Sassoon Hospital in Pune, India, on February 25th, 1894, to the day he died at Merizad in Maharashtra, India, Merwan Sharia Irani was 100% Persian. This is a fact and one that's often overlooked when uh, Mayor Baba's life is described and discussed. He's often described as being a, a, an Indian spiritual master, and certainly that's true. He, he was an Indian citizen, although he also had a Persian passport. But uh, he was born in India, and he was very much Indian, but he was specifically Persian. So over the course of this series... Uh, we're going to consider the events of Mayor Baba's life primarily, as I said earlier, through three different lenses. Uh, the first lens is the academic lens of the history of religions. And under that sort of broad umbrella, the second lens is the central importance of Merwan's encounter with Baba John and his own interpretation of that experience. He is interpreted as a divine revelation of his own identity with the Godhead. Now, what's particularly remarkable about this, I mean, it's, it's, as a central event, it's remarkable in itself, but the reason it's so remarkable for us and the reason why it's uh, absolutely essential to understand the whole trajectory of the rest of his life is that his conviction in and his adherence to this interpretation, this interpretation that he was identified with the Godhead, this interpretation of his experience continued without a break right up to the final days of his life. And when you, it, it's remarkable really that he'll be, doing this and that, and then all of a sudden he, he speaks without even a break about uh, this state that he's enjoying constantly or experiencing. Sometimes it's not enjoying it. Sometimes he, he describes it as being great suffering. 
but uh, it's such a central feature that nothing else uh, that goes on in his life can really be understood. And a person does not have to accept that he's identified with the Godhead, but we do have to uh, really, that nothing makes sense unless we recognize his own conviction in and his own adherence to this interpretation. So that's the second lens. And the third lens uh, through which I want to view Mayor Baba's life is the essential role of Mayor Baba's Persian ethnicity uh, and how that influenced his life, how it influenced his personality, and how his Persian ethnicity influenced his own work as a spiritual leader. So in addition to that, I mean, those are the primary lenses, but in addition to that, uh, cultural context in general is particularly important as we attempt to understand and categorize Merwan's early experiences with Baba John and his experiences with the other spiritual figures that he encountered, as well as our attempts to understand many of the events in Merwan's, that is, Mayor Baba's subsequent life and work. Uh, even Mayor Baba's close disciples were often puzzled by his choices and by his behavior. Seen through the lens of Western rationalism, which is what we're trying to bring to bear through the, the idea of uh, history of religions, through that lens, uh, through just a cold, uh, rational lens, Mayor Baba's life and work will sometimes seem erratic and indecisive. Uh, he does one thing, he, he sets up a school, then he takes it down, and he decides he's going to do all this stuff, and then he says, nope, I'm going to do something else. Uh, so how are we going to understand these things? Um, when they're seen through the lens of Merwan's early exposure to Persian Sufi ideas, as expressed through his father's explanations of the poetry of Hafiz, Merwan's behavior can be seen as coming into focus as an expression of Sufi, Sufi ethics and Sufi morality. So the question arises, which lens best describes the life and work of Mayor Baba? Can it be strictly Western, uh, Western rationalism, or can, uh, can we apply this Persian lens and the lens of his own interpretation of his experiences and all that? Well, these are questions that we're going to explore throughout the series. Obviously, I think that uh, all three of these uh, can work together and be uh, be helpful to us in understanding Mayor Baba in a way that's both acceptable to people who follow Mayor Baba and to people who just come in cold and are trying to make sense out of this whole trajectory of his life, which uh, is quite, by any measure, is really quite remarkable. So that's going to be our our task over the uh, over the next uh be pretty much a year. I'm going to be in, uh, I hope to be in India uh, in June and early July, so we, we won't have any uh, meetings then, but uh, up into December, we're going to try to cover a lot of material. And even then, there'll be a lot left on the cutting room floor, of course. So one of the salient features of Mayor Baba's personality and one of the most visible aspects of his Persian ethnicity was his love for the Persian poet Hafiz. This love of Hafiz and his decidedly Sufi interpretation of the poetry of Hafiz was a part of his close relationship to and love for his father, Shariar Irani. And now my intention is going to be to show not only how Meher Baba's love of Hafiz was an expression of his Persian ethnicity, but also uh, to show how similar aesthetic categories, that is, similar schemas of value, similar uh, categories of thought, of moral behavior uh, that was found in uh, Hafiz uh, can also be found uh, in the life and the work of Meher Baba. Uh, now, a lot of, I'm going to get into that, and in, I've been talking in kind of an abstract way, um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get into some more details in a minute. So the question of Meher Baba's eth the Persian ethnicity, uh, it's, it's really indisputable. His father, Shariar Mundagar Khorram Shahi, and Khorram Shahi simply uh, refers to, uh, I believe, the village in which he was uh, born in, uh, in Iran. Uh, he, he was born as a Rastrian in Persia uh, in 1853. Shariar, or later called Shariar, migrated from Iran to Bombay, uh, Bombay, India, uh, with his brother Kodadad around the year 1874. Shariar later moved north to Pune, where he was, uh, there, there was there in Pune a large and growing 
Persian community. And a lot of this, uh, some of you, if you saw this, it, you'll find up on the Mayor Center website. I did a, a series on Baba and his Persian ethnicity and, and Hafiz. And some of this material you'll find there uh, in, in some more detail that I'm going to give it here. But uh, it's, it's a good background. We're also going to say more about the specifics of Pune in the first sort of uh, period of Baba's life that we're going to cover. And this is this first introductory uh, presentation is really mostly just to set the stage for how we're going to going to be looking at all these things. But we're going to talk about Pune and the British colonialism and the whole environment of India into which Marwan was born uh, in our first module, which will be uh, in, I think it's March 17th or 18th, 17th, I think. So, uh, Sharyar moved into this growing Persian community. Mayor Baba's mother, Shireen Khorram Shahi, which doesn't mean they were related, simply means they were some, from the same area in Iran. Shireen Khorram Shahi was born in Bombay herself in 1878, but this was shortly after her Persian parents had migrated from Persia to Bombay. They, too, soon moved to Pune because they had family there, uh, and there Shireen met and eventually married Sheriar, and that's a that's a whole story which we won't even have time to get into next time. But there's there's lots of fascinating things there. But all of it is to say that there's no question that uh, Merwan was 100% Persian. So when Meher Baba began following Baba John as a part of this small Persian community, uh, and of course he was following other spiritual masters as well. This was a complete disaster for poor Shireen's social hopes. Rather than moving up the social ladder, someone from the Persian community beginning to follow a Muslim or a Hindu spiritual master was seen to be completely scandalous. It was seen as descending in the social ranks, and it was seen as going native rather than moving up in the social ranks. So this it was a great distress for her for many years. Uh, this was compounded by the fact that so many People, even Shireen herself, felt that Merwan had simply gone mad or that he'd become mentally deranged in some way because uh, he had such great prospects. And now all of a sudden he's just wandering around in, in a completely self-absorbed state and following off after spiritual teachers and things that she just did. She was beside herself. Meher Baba's father, Sheriar, on the other hand, saw things quite differently. Throughout his life, Sheriar had spiritual aspirations rather than social aspirations. He had a long history of spiritual seeking, and he immediately interpreted the, the experiences of his second son, Merwan, as having spiritual significance. Sheriar was steeped in Persian mysticism, and he enjoyed a special bond of closeness with his young son, Merwan, whom both Sheriar and Shireen referred to affectionately as Merog. So, uh, a part of that bond between Sheriar and Merwan, young Merwan, was expressed through their common love of Hafiz. And according to one source, uh, Bao Kauchuri says that, quote, Merwan had a deep passion for poetry and would ask his father to read the Divan of Hafiz to him and to explain its true meaning. Father and son would sit together until late in the night. The boy would remember whatever poems his father read, close quote. Well, from this account, it appears that this was the beginning of young Merwan's lifelong love of the poetry of Hafiz. It was also the be beginning of his exposure to Sufi ideas, which he learned through the spiritual explanations of the poetry of Hafiz given to him by his father, Sheriar. And uh, we'll say more about Sheriar's own history and his own, although he is Zoroastrian and most Persian Sufis were uh, Islamic, uh, he will we'll say more about how it is that he became, uh, he was re even referred to as being a dervish from a very young age and uh, eventually did settle down. But uh, he was steeped in in all of the, uh, the Persian uh, Sufi practices and thought and was very familiar, of course, mostly with Hafiz, but also with the other Persian poets. So... Uh, even so, even as, as much as Sheriar and Merwan loved Hafiz, they were not the only Persians to love the poetry of Hafiz. The poetry of Hafiz has for centuries been emblematic of the Persian ethos itself. Uh, according to one scholar, quote, Hafiz 
is the most popular of Persian poets. If a book of poetry is to be found in a Persian home, it is likely to be the Divan of Hafiz. Many of his lines have become proverbial sayings, and there are few who cannot recite some of his lyrics partially or totally by heart. His divan is widely used in divination. Stories abound about his inspired predictions, and yet he is also a poet's poet. No other Persian poet has been the subject of so much analysis, so much commentary and interpretation, nor has any poet influenced the course of post-14th century Persian lyrics as much as he has, close quote. Now, uh, another scholar has said that, quote, Hafiz and his divan have become the foci of a shared national sentiment that gather Iranians of various stripes from zealot religionists to ardent secularists into an imagined community of spiritual patrimony. And that's a lot of big words, but all it means is that everybody in... Uh, Iran tends to, or certainly a large percentage of people really, really, really love Hafiz, but they don't all interpret him in the same way. Uh, you could say that he is a representative of Persian culture. Uh, his influence is stretched from the arts to spirituality and even to nationalism, but that does not mean that, uh, that everyone understood him the same way. For us, the importance of statements like these is that there is not simply one interpretation of Hafiz. Some read the poetry of Hafiz as political commentary. Some read his poetry as celebrating literal libertinism. They think when he talks about drinking wine, they're saying, yeah, he's drinking wine, good for him. And they think he's really getting drunk and doing that. Others uh, who interpret Hafiz through this Persian Sufi lens, like Sharyar and his son Merwan, read into the guzzles of Hafiz metaphorical messages of Sufi ideology and cosmology rooted in Islamic theology and ancient Persian culture. There's references to things that you would not understand if you didn't understand Islamic theology and things that you wouldn't understand if you didn't understand uh, the, particularly the uh, Fardausi's uh, Book of Kings, the Shah Nama, uh, which is all the the ancient stories of Jamshed and you, you, a lot of us know the names of uh, members of Mayor Baba's family and other, other Parsi people who have names like Rustam and Sorab and uh, Jamshed and uh, uh, Hoshang. These are all names that come out of this uh, ancient Book of Kings and the, the ancient uh, Persian mythology. And all this runs through the poetry of Hafiz. So for some schools of Islamic theology, we find three dimensions of Islam. And this is just kind of uh, important just to, again, to, to help to frame this idea of how uh, Persian Sufism influenced Hafiz and the Persian Sufi interpretation of Hafiz uh, is grounded in these ideas. So there are three dimensions of Islam from this perspective. Uh, Islam is one dimension, that means surrender to God. Iman is faith, that's another uh, th second dimension. And the third dimension is isan, and that's been translated as doing what is beautiful. Now, according to one saying, one hadith of the prophet, it's called the hadith of Gabriel, uh, the prophet Muhammad himself said that isan means, quote, to worship God as if you see him, for if you do not see him, he sees you. So this is from the prophet himself, and this is the idea of behaving in a, you could say, a hyper-ethical way. There's a, there's a morality and an ethics that transcends any kind of uh, tradition, any kind of regular uh, way of thinking about, uh, certainly not the juridical Islam, certainly not the, the Islam of the, the strict uh, interpretation of rule and law and sharia and all that. Uh, this attitude of worshiping God as if you see him, as if he's present at everything you do, this is why you want to do what is beautiful. Uh, this is the, the idea of asan, meaning doing what is beautiful. You behave that way because you want God to see you doing these things. You want to act every day as if you see him in front of you because you also know that he is seeing you. Well, this attitude, this idea, this higher ethic, you could call it, is at the very root of Sufi philosophy and Persian uh, Sufism, and it runs throughout 
the poetry of Hafiz. I'm going to go into a lot more detail about that, uh, but we'll have to wait a moment for that. So up to this point, uh, as I said, I've been describing this influence of Persian Sufism and especially of Hafiz on Mayor Baba's life and work in a pretty abstract way. And what I want to do is to, to relate some specifics now. Uh, and to that end, I want to focus on four different categories of values that are expressed in the poetry of Hafiz and suggest how they appear in the life, behavior, and spiritual teachings of Mayor Baba. And it's, I, I, these are important because as we move through his life, and they're, I won't say they explain everything that Mayor Baba, Mayor Baba was doing, but there are many, many, many of his behaviors that when viewed through the two lenses, the one lens of his conviction about his experience with Baba John, and the second lens being his uh, sense of this higher morality of doing what is beautiful and falling into these categories, I think this helps us to understand choices that he made and, and uh, things that occurred throughout his life. So the four categories, and there are many other categories that we could pull from Hafiz and from Persian Sufism and see them reflected in Mayor Baba's life. These are quite central, I think, so I'm going to focus on these just for today. And these four categories are the lover and the beloved, which represent metaphorically the idea of union versus separation. Union, of course, being the ultimate goal and separation being the state of the uh, the spiritual aspirant. It's all through Hafiz, and of course, it's all through Meher Baba's work as well. Now, uh, another sort of reflection of that is the master-disciple relationship in, in this sense uh, often, or I should say rarely, does Hafiz explicitly say master and disciple. He might say lover and beloved. He might talk about the the wise uh, person. He might talk about the Saki. But uh, at least uh, Sheriar and Merwan, for example, people who interpret Hafiz through this uh, Sufi lens, understand those terms to also represent metaphorically, symbolically, the master-disciple relationship. Then uh, another category is madness versus reason. And this is represented also uh, symbolically as wine and intoxication versus reason and sobriety. So all of that. But the idea of madness, this is very, very important in understanding Mary Bob's work. And particularly, we'll talk about this a lot when we get to these sections on uh, uh, his work with the musts. I think it's in uh, number six of the talks. Uh, so that's the third category. And then the fourth category is hypocrisy versus authenticity. And this is something that's really quite a uh, uh, an innovation by Hafiz. Uh, Guzzle poetry really was mostly love poetry. And, and you could see the lover and beloved things in, uh, in early, in other words, pre-Hafiz poetry. And you might see, you could, if you wanted to read metaphorically, the master and disciple relationship in pre hafiz poetry but the madness versus reason stuff is is uh something of, a, of an innovation but this whole business of hypocrisy versus authenticity is really quite an innovation where he he talks about uh people in the in the social group and the uh the maybe the chief of the police or the certainly he was very critical of actually of sufis see i'm saying he he was uh expressing sufi uh, ideology, but in fact, the Sufis of his day were actually the clergy. They were the people he was talking against. So he'll often say critical things of Sufis. But uh, what we think of as Persian Sufism today and the ideology behind Persian Sufism is what he was expressing, not the, uh, there's a, a saying about how the, the Sufism of that time had lost, it only had the form and had lost its its true meaning. And uh, Hafiz was, uh, at least in this interpretation, Hafiz was expressing the true meaning of Sufism. So under this category of hypocrisy and authenticity, we're going to get really uh, esoteric here. There's a, a branch of uh, belief in in uh, Persian and uh, Middle Eastern Sufi thought of the, Malahi, the Malamatiya and the Kalandaria. Those are two different groups that have similar types of philosophies that uh, we'll see the significance, I hope, as I continue. Um, and there's a sort of a character that Hafiz plays throughout his poetry, which is the rend. 
and uh, again, I'll get a little more into the uh, the, the red is sort of just a a, a ruffian, a, a ne'er do well, uh, a thug, a kind of just a a bad guy who goes drinking and creating problems and stuff. And Hop is repeatedly refers to himself as a rend and celebrates the the uh, uh, the values and and the 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 good qualities of the rend and. We'll see what that is, why that is in just a second. So to start out with, <clears throat> this is probably the most obvious that no one will have any trouble understanding is this idea of the lover and beloved separation versus union. Uh, examples from Hafiz. This is a couplet from Hafiz. I showed my bloodied tears to the doctors. They said, quote, your tears are caused by the pain. Yeah, it's... it's uh obscured by this little window here your tears are obscured by the pain of love the only cure for this is the burning of the heart then this is a set of different couplets from another uh, guzzle he says my heart has turned to blood from not seeing my beloved truly the time of separation is a time of horror do not scorn the tears that my eyes weep for you from these tears Small stream, yeah. From these small streams, deep oceans are formed. The opportunity for union has passed, and we took no notice. Sing Hafiz, sing the songs of separation. So, all of this is about the lover and the beloved, and the the pain of the separation, and the longing for union. And I know they could bear repetition, but we've got more things to cover. So. Mehrbaba again really doesn't need any examples. I'm sure many of you could you could name some yourselves. But, uh, just to begin with, Mehrbaba called his followers his lovers. Even today, followers of Mehrbaba call themselves Baba lovers. Why is that? That comes from this whole lover beloved relationship that's expressed repeatedly throughout the Guzzle poetry of Hafiz. Uh, and uh, one of the most well known uh, quotes from Mehrbaba on this topic, he says. Quote, the sojourn of the soul is a thrilling divine romance in which the lover, who in the beginning is conscious of nothing but emptiness, frustration, superficiality, and the gnawing chains of bondage, gradually attains an increasingly fuller and freer expression of love, and ultimately disappears and merges in the divine beloved to realize the unity of the lover and the beloved in the supreme and eternal fact of God as infinite love, close quote. So uh, I'm sure many of you have heard that one, but it's clearly very much uh, really one of the finest statements of this whole lover, beloved, separation versus union, kind of all encapsulated in one little paragraph. Now, uh, the master-disciple relationship is really sort of an extension of this lover, beloved relationship, at least in a, uh, what you call a, uh, a metaphorical or a symbolic way. And uh, among the followers of Mayor Baba, there's a very well-known example of uh, this category is the three couplets of Hafiz that Mayor Baba had read out just hours before he passed away. And imagine now, uh, if you know the story of Mayor Baba's passing, he was suffering greatly, going through spasms, just uh, in unbelievably bad condition. And yet... He, he had the presence of mind to call uh, his disciple named Oliva to come in and bring this uh, this plaque that had these three uh, quotes. These are from different guzzles and not from the same guzzle, but he had pulled these quotes as quotes that he repeated quite often. Uh, it was actually Balna too who uh, put this together for Baba and Baba liked it very much and called it out just before he uh, passed away. First one, befitting a fortunate slave, carry out every command of the master without any question of why and what. This is all from Hafiz. The second one, about what you hear from the master, never say it is wrong, because, my dear, the fault lies in your own incapacity to understand him. And finally, I am the slave of the master who has released me from ignorance. Whatever my master does is of the highest benefit of all concerned. And clearly that's a, a very... Uh, strong. And now there, we have to also uh, recognize that 
not everyone would use the word master there. This is the way Baba translated it himself. But the important thing is not, even if that's what it, Wahaf is intended, the important thing for understanding Meher Baba and the trajectory of his life is that this is how he understood it, and this is how he communicated it to his followers and to his family and everyone else. So the main theme of all three of these couplets are surrender to the will of the master. And this is a part of this whole thing. It's, it's, it is an extension of the idea of surrendering to the will of the beloved, as we saw in the lover-beloved relationship. So uh, now here's another example where Mayor Baba uh, quotes Hafiz. Uh, Baba explained that the master of Hafiz, whose name was Faruddin Attar, not the poet, but this is another Attar, he explained that he had long tresses of black hair. And Hafiz says in the following poet uh, poem, do not let your hair flow freely as my heart receives an arrow from every hair. O beloved, these tears that I shed are tears of blood so precious that you should consider them as pearls and wear them as earrings. So Baba is quoting this in the Purdom's book, The God Man, uh, as I illustrating a point. He repeatedly throughout his life would use, especially towards uh, the Guru Prasad days and uh, uh, later, uh, just before that in Merizad, he was constantly quoting Hafiz to uh, underline a point that he was making. Another story, Baba says, Hafiz quotes a perfect master as saying, I killed my friend and nourished my foe. Even God has no authority to ask why the perfect master does this or that. To explain this, Baba, this is, that was the quote. Now Baba is saying, to explain this, I would have to prolong my stay for several more days. It has deep meaning. When you suffer, don't worry. Say, it is Baba's grace. Then I am pleased with your love. So to underland, uh, underline points that he was making, uh, particularly about the relationship between the master and the disciple, he would quote Hafiz. So now the next category is the category of wine, intoxication, and madness versus reason. And that's also, you could say, reason is uh, kind of the co eval with sobriety when you're looking at the uh, wine and intoxication aspect of it. Uh, so here's some examples from Hafiz, and there are countless examples of Hafiz about wine and intoxication and all that. But he says, after more than 40 years, I still boast that I am the least of all the servants of the master. Through the favor of the wine vendor's kindred affection, my cup has never been left empty of pure and luminous wine. In love's ranking and by the luck of the reprobates, who sincerely risk everything, my seat in the tavern remains a seat of high honor. Do not think ill of me for draining the wine dregs. Although my garment has been stained, my spirit is clean. Now, these, uh, these are important lines, not only because they talk about wine and intoxication, but as we'll see, uh, they relate specifically to this idea of malamatia and calendaria that I was talking about in the, the category of hypocrisy versus authenticity. Uh, he goes on, I am the falcon on the, wrist, on the wrist of the master. O Lord, how can they forget my affection for this perch? Hafez, how long will you continue to drink secretly and hide your cup underneath your patched coat? At the master's banquet, I will pull back your cloak and reveal what you're drinking. In other words, he's pretending to be in them. He's pretending to be a pious member of the gathering at the master's feet. And in fact, he's secretly drinking wine. And of course, there's multiple uh, symbolic meanings to all of these, which we don't have time to get into. And now, of course, wine drinking discussed by Hafiz is typically understood, certainly was understood by Sharyar and Merwan, to mean the intoxication of love for the divine beloved, not the intoxication of wine. Mayor Baba used this exact connotation when discussing the musts, referring to them as being God intoxicated. But there's another level to this as well. Initially, both medical professionals and Mayor Baba's mother herself interpreted Mayor Baba's revelation of his own godhood and his experiences at the hands of Baba John as madness. For decades, members of the Parsi community continued to hold this view towards Mayor Baba. And in William Donkin's book, The Wayfarers, Mayor Baba explains something of this. And again, this is his reading of both his experience and how people, other people read. And now he's talking about the musts here, but I'm saying that it applies as well to, to his own experience and this whole idea of madness 
versus reason. And this is just a short, we could go into a lot more detail of this, but for now, this will do. He says, quote, according to one way of interpretation, madness is a deviation from the average mode of consciousness and behavior. And its degree, the degree of madness, is to be measured by the amount of its departure from the average pattern. But according to another way of interpretation, madness is the incapacity of consciousness to understand or express truth, and its degree, the degree of madness, is to be measured by the extent to which it deviates from the truth. And he goes on to say, and this can be understood to mean that just because uh, if everybody is mad, then that's normal, that's average. And if someone, the must, for example, or someone who's received a kiss from Baba John and, and had a revelation, they are above the line, they're above average, and so they appear to be mad to the average person. And this is how Hafiz expresses the idea of madness, this is how he understands and expresses the ideas of wine and all that. And uh, again, this is a category that's going to be really, really important in understanding uh, Mayor Baba's behavior and his understanding of his own state as we go through uh, the different phases of his life. Okay, so this final category is the category of hypocrisy versus authenticity. And uh, an example from Hafiz, uh, there are preachers who make a great show in the pulpit, but when they retire to their chambers in private, they engage in very different pursuits. I have a problem. Please go and ask the wise ones of the assembly. Why is it that those who call us to repentance repent so little of themselves? It seems they do not believe in nor fear the judgment day. They claim to represent the judge that yet they practice falsehood and deceit. So he's talking about the, uh, the clergy, the Islamic clergy, and even the Sufi clergy, and how they are hypocrites, and at least he's not a hypocrite. When I awoke at dawn, he says, from the heavens there came a sound. Reason spoke, saying, I know what it is. It's the angels chanting. They must be memorizing the songs of Hafez. So he's saying that the angels who sing to God really like these things he's saying about the hypocritical priests and everything. So that's one example. There's, m there's countless examples about hypocrisy and authenticity in Hafez. So uh, again, uh, we're all familiar, I'm sure, with uh, how that shows up in Mayor Baba's life and work and what he had to say about it. He says, quote, the only sin which God does not forgive is hypocrisy. The hypocrite deceives himself and others too. These days, the hypocritical saints have increased in such numbers that, though I am the ocean of compassion, it has become nauseating even to me, close quote. It is no sin, is another quote, it is no sin if one does not believe in God, but to be a hypocrite is a sin. If you have no faith, it does not matter. By coming to me, you do not lower or raise my status. It is immaterial if you do not come to me. But when you come, if you continue to be hypocritical, it displeases me. I will not be displeased if you speak against me or do not come to me, but I cannot tolerate hypocrisy because a hypocrite not only harms himself, but also disturbs the faith of others. Close quote. Now, Again, I'm going to get a little esoteric here, but I think it's very worthwhile because this really uh, cuts to the heart of some of the kind of thornier problems that people have in trying to trying to figure out what in the world was Mayor Baba doing in this situation or that situation. So uh, the first category, this is a, a group of, and I, I don't have at my fingertips the uh, correct, this is one of the places I'll be corrected by someone, but uh, the Malamatia is, it's, it's kind of like a Sufi a uh, movement in uh, 13th, 14th century uh, Persia. Uh, and the idea is that the exterior behavior is wild and nonconformist, while the inner heart is kept pure. Remember, we read just earlier about how Hafiz said, uh, although his wine, his cloak is stained with wine, his heart is pure. This is a Malamatia type of attitude. Thus, blame and a bad reputation improves one's humility and improves the spiritual quest. So if uh, people criticize you, if people think badly of you, uh, and you're, as long as your heart is still pure and your intention is still pure, that not only isn't a bad thing, 
it's it uh, helps you to maintain your humility and it helps you uh, to move along the spiritual path. So this is central to a lot of, of Hafiz. Uh, as I said, there's a, a character sort of that, that Hafiz plays or that is represented in his poetry, uh, the, the idea of the rend. And uh, the rend is variously translated in English as a rake or a ruffian or a pious rogue or a brigand or a libertine or a lout or a debauchee, etc. This is this all comes from a uh, actually the Encyclopedia Ironica, um, and and it's a very antithesis of establishment and propriety. But uh, the idea of this character is that this character plays into the Malamatia idea, and as we'll see in a second, the Kalandaria idea of putting out something that will be criticized, but maintaining. Uh, in, in the the Tao Te King, Lao Tzu talks about the uh, the Chinese book of philosophy. He talks about keeping the left hand tally, which means to behave honestly, even if everyone around you is being dishonest, to behave honestly. And this is a similar kind of thing, where except that one deliberately looks as if they're being dishonest, looks as if they're being you know flouting all the rules of propriety, whereas in fact, uh, Hafiz in one poem talks about how he. He plays that role, but but he re delights in the uh, early morning reading of the Quran. So he's got this, his whole purpose is to love God, but he's letting other people think that uh, he's something else entirely. Similar to this is the Kalandaria. There's a little twist with the Kalandaria. And the Kalandaria trusts that their honesty and their absence of hypocrisy will attract God's grace. In other words, uh, we read that poem of Hafiz, where Hafiz is saying that the the preachers uh you know the islamic preachers do things in their chamber that they where they hide uh their their secret behaviors whatever that is uh whereas the kalandaria would do that openly if they're going to have girlfriends and they're going to drink wine and you know fool around or whatever it is they do it openly and even though they're not following the law they're so honest there's absolute absence of hypocrisy and so because of that, they feel they will attract God's grace. This is another thing that's uh, that's found in the poetry of Hafiz. It's just another way of looking at it. And some, not exactly this idea particularly, but that some aspect of all, all of these things can be found also in the behavior uh, and in the life of Meher Baba. So here are some quotes illustrating Meher Baba's congruence, with this, particularly with this Malamatia philosophy. Quote, during late January 1923, criticism of Meher Baba and the Mondali began appearing in a local Gujarati newspaper. A few days before Rupasni Maharaj had also been criticized in the same paper. The public was warned to keep away from Baba and his band of unscrupulous followers. The master paid no heed to the newspaper editor's criticism and would not allow anyone to write a rebuttal. Close quote. Now, this is uh, not from the same uh, e uh, time, uh, not the same event, but it's Mayor Baba's response to similar attacks. He says, quote, you have a great lesson to learn from this opposition. Learn that those who spread deceitful lies about our actions and propagandize against us are thereby giving importance to our work without our asking. They publicize our cause, advertising it widely in a way which we could not have done. This is their service to us, close quote. And this actually is a long, long talk that he gives. And he in, uh, didn't want to get into the whole thing. But in that, he continues to go on and say that uh, that it teaches, he's telling the model, he's going to teach all of us, meaning mostly them, going to teach us humility. So celebrate it, accept it, embrace it. Don't be, don't be try to, you know, fight it and, and tell people how great we are. This, they're doing us a service, Baba says. And this is right in line with Malamatia thought. And Baba made many similar statements when uh, people spoke against him on a number of different occasions. This was particularly true around the question of his breaking his silence. People spoke against him because he did not break his silence at the Hollywood Bowl. And repeatedly, Baba would issue announcements that he was going to break his silence. And then apparently, he would not do so. Erich would often try to talk Baba out of issuing yet another announcement that Baba was going to break his silence because Erich was concerned about all the public backlash. And Baba would say, what? What are you criticizing me? I'm definitely going to break my silence. So he'd put it out in the newspaper, and then Baba would say, I changed my mind. I'll do it next week. And then this went on and on, and Erich would just give up eventually. 
So similarly, when Baba experienced his two automobile accidents and suffered terribly, he was widely criticized for claiming to be God in human form, although he was apparently unable to avoid serious injury in two automobile accidents. In all of these cases, Mayor Baba maintained an attitude that was entirely free of hypocrisy and entirely in keeping with the Malamatya spirit and with the spirit of Hafiz. And I might say he also maintained throughout those experiences this complete conviction and uh, uh, unabating interpretation of events as emanating from uh, his own identity with the Godhead. So I've had a lot to say. I uh, appreciate y'all being, uh, sorry if I raced through it a little bit at times because I wanted to cover everything because this is going to be the, the sort of the backbone of how we look at uh, Mayor Baba through the uh, remaining uh, installments of this series. So in conclusion, uh, throughout these remaining talks, we're going to approach the life of Mayor Baba through this lens of the history of religions, through the lens of his own understanding of his experience with the Muslim holy woman, Hazrat Baba John, as well as through the lens of his Persian ethnicity, his love of Persian Sufism, and especially his love of the Persian poet Hafiz. This is, uh, I hope, will provide some backbone for the explanatory uh, uh, frame that we use to uh, discuss Mayor Baba's life and try to put it in a perspective that uh, is resonant both with uh, with him himself, with uh, people who follow Mayor Baba and people who was perhaps uh, never heard of him. So uh, the next talk in this series is going to be on Sunday the 17th at 5 p.m. Uh, Eastern Time. Hope you all join us here at the Mayor Spiritual Center. This will be called uh, Birth and Early Life. Colonial India, Pune, and the Zoroastrian community from 1894 to 1913. So thank you all. And if there's any uh, contributions, discussion, questions, I welcome your kind uh, questions. Thank you. <laughs>